everybody. Hey, Will Robertson, of course, Film Festival Live. And uh, the show. Uh, we're supposed to be on a 10, but unfortunately, I think our our first guest must have experienced some technical difficulty because I was waiting. It's me tapping my fingers. Film Festival Live used to be um, actinguprradio.com, but uh, I've switched because who the hell knows what radio is, right? Okay. So anyway, uh, the show is for filmmakers, film festivals, actors, any sort of creatives. And, you know, so I talk a little bit about everything. I'm very dark today. I noticed that I look very dark. So um, it's Friday here and everywhere, I hope. Well, I'm in everywhere right now that we're in the United States. Uh, and so uh, today's show, we're going to just talk to a really cool person that I've actually sort of known for, um, gee whiz, a long time. And I started off originally in the Monterey Peninsula. And if you don't know what that is, Pebble Beach for golf and all the other fun stuff and uh, or how we refer to it as uh, the newlywed and the nearly dead. But Monterey, Salinas, as a matter of fact, next week I will be on the road. May not have a show. I'm not sure if I want to try to do this on the road because it won't look as good as this. Um, I'll be at the Salinas Rodeo because, you know, I do cowboy stuff. So I'll be there at the rodeo for four days, which I'm actually excited about because it's the first time as a cowboy I can wear a mask like we're robbing a bank and people will be like, I look normal. So that'll be kind of fun. Uh, back in my stomping grounds, I lived in that area for a long time. But one of the things I want to talk about today is, is that you don't have to be in Hollywood anymore. You just don't. You can be anywhere you want and be a filmmaker, a producer, a writer, a director, all that fun stuff, which is kind of funny because when I started my career 100 years ago uh, in Monterey, uh, San Francisco Bay Area, had a couple agents up there, went back and forth two and a half hours each way which is kind of a trend for me because now I live in Temecula, California, which is two and a half hours away from LA. And I go there sometimes three or four times a week. Insane? No, dedicated. So anyway, uh, lived in Monterey and did a lot of that stuff. That's how I, my career started. And in the beginning, when you were an actor back in, well, uh, an actor back in the 80s, you couldn't say that you were an actor, director, writer, producer. They would be like, make up your mind. You're an actor or you're a director. Well, nowadays, it's kind of funny because if you don't have that, look, I have actor and host here. Uh, if you don't have the moniker and the different things that you've done, it's kind of like you're a one-trick pony. And I got to tell you, that doesn't work. It's as, it's as successful as having a black and white headshot. Not going to happen. So today, oh, there goes my microphone. So today, we're going to talk to a, a filmmaker, producer, writer, Jack of all trades and a master of a few of them, I may add. Um, and we're going to get on the air with them. First thing I want to say, or last thing I want to say before I introduce Lawrence, <coughs> is that uh, as an actor, uh, gee whiz, lots of great stuff happening. By the way, today they released the pre-sale of the iPhone 13, which I'm pretty excited about. A uh, little tech thing is, is that it has a cinematography a button where you can click on it and that's pretty cool very excited by that oh look we have facebook users saying i don't know what that is it's smoochy smoochy party and uh whatever face and then someone by the name of master always good to have a master making comments about you anyway um so if you have comments or any kind of suggestions you, we are on multiple platforms from facebook live to of them um, from you know youtube and so on you'll see they pop up and as they do we'll bring them up if there's questions if you have questions for myself or our guest so let's skip right on to it and get to the show because i want to talk to them more than i want to talk about me or me talking so uh this person i i know has uh, credibility and has been in the industry for a long time because I used to work with one of the places I started out was a place called KCBA Fox 35 or KION TV. And I was a Fox Kids Club host on air for seven years and a CBS feature reporter. I had a segment that I ran around town and did fun things. It's kind of fun because in the beginning of it, uh, I started just doing the vignette stuff on the Kids Club, Fox Kids, when Fox cared about kids anyway and uh so i wound up producing a lot of these cool segments and they said hey why don't we have you go around town and hit all the events happening 
awesome time. I was able to do what we can do today, which is grab our phones, in this case a camera, beta SP, 80 pounds, and produce stuff that was fun. And then get in an editing, editing bay that costs like a half a million dollars. Now, <laughs> this is the editing bay. And it was it's probably better now than that was back then. So anyway, this gentleman worked in news. And he's done all types of stuff. And he's gotten great connections. And now I'm going to show you a little some of his work. And a, a young lady that's working with him that I know is an actor that moved to that area. Crazy. They have a film company. Watch this. You're going to love this one. As soon as I find out where the hell it is, there it is. He took my wife. Get out of my house. He came in the night and they took her. You know where they're headed? On the South Trail, towards Mexico. You be careful. Jackson, you remember me? Who could forget? It's our group of riders of yesterday and one woman. Those men are the worst of their kind. Hello, sir. I collect the toll from safe passage. What kind of toll? Everything you got. Maybe even your soul. They call you Diablo. He's killed more men than you met in your lifetime. If anything happens to me, you run from here. fights with me. My fight is with everybody. Now say your prayers. Say it! We live or we die. We are to the Lord. Bring it to me! That might just be a favor to you. Wow. So first of all, I love the. By the way, welcome to the show, Lawrence. Thank you. Well, pleasure yeah, to be I'm, here. I'm, I'm very excited. Uh, first of all, watching that trailer reminded me of what people do on Instagram, and I absolutely despise this, which is they do that thing where they can put their face in a film. Watching this, oh, yeah. knowing, knowing that it's uh, Scott is Clint's son, you kind of go, "This kind of looks like." Someone put Clint Eastwood's face on theirs, and it's his son. Wow. They they actually there's a a deep fake uh, where they did put uh, Mr. Eastwood as I've always called him. Yeah. Um, they put his face as a young man on um, on Scott's face. It's on YouTube. So if you search deep fake Scott Eastwood Diablo, it, it is a trip, dude. Because I I've been. Um, fortunate enough to direct both of them yeah. and and I really like both of them and it's just interesting seeing the father-son dynamic and and the bloodline is so strong you know Clint's such an icon yeah. Scott has a lot of that but I think he's going to be iconic for you know our generation yeah so. no I, I I agree I think that probably the only thing that he'll have to do is he might have to keep doing a few westerns to establish that because dad you know I mean, what can you say? And immediately when I started watching this, you can't I'm beat like, dad. What's that? You can't beat dad. There's no way. I mean, he hit it in the right moment, the right time. And it was, it was like history that was just, you know, took hold. And so Scott will find a different, um, he'll find a different approach and a different way to become iconic. But I believe he will, if not ever reach Clint, cause he's such an anomaly at least find his own path like kind of like kirk douglas and michael yeah. douglas you know um that's a good point but yeah you can just never be better than clint <laughs> well i don't i don't know if the word better is the best word but i would say it's the that, wrong word but you know 
Yeah, I know what you're saying. But I think that, uh, again, looking at this, uh, knowing that he is, of course, Clint Eastwood's son, I, I think I'm dying to see if he's going to try to do a Dirty Harry, if he's going to – I mean – why not? Hey, look, if, if I had, if my last name was someone like Baldwin or, or Eastwood, I, I, I wouldn't have a problem with being typecast because uh, the work is work. So let's talk about your work. First of all, Space Rock Studios. Um, you can see it above on there if you want to follow them. Are you, you're on Instagram, right? No, I'm, I'm very not social media. <laughs> so I'm, I'm on Facebook if you can find me. I'm very not. Yeah. No, I know you said that offline. I said, hey, you know, I, I was looking. Where's your – and you're like, yeah, I don't give a shit about that. And that's all good. So let's let's talk a little bit about um, – you started off in – I mean, I guess the, the question I want to ask you is that I, John Freeman, who we both know, uh, a really great guy. Great director. Was, yeah, what, yeah, he's a great guy. And he, um, he started off with ROTC. I remember I was doing theater with John and he goes, I got a job at the, you know, the ROTC type of thing where you would do production. How did you start out? You know, I was um, in high school and I was about 14 years old and, um, you know, I'd just become a freshman in, in, at Carmel High and uh, was a skateboarder. And was working, working at, um, you know, the skateboard shop. And I, I had a tiny little sponsorship with Santa Cruz Speed Wheels. I get a box of wheels every month and, and uh, among with, with some of the other local kids. And I, I saw a snowboard. This guy, Monty Roach um, from Tahoe, yeah. started working at our shop and he ordered snowboards and he was a pro snowboarder. So the moment I started snowboarding, you know, it was a deep lifelong passion yeah. and to make a long story short, I realized I was not going to be the world champion, but maybe holding a camera, I could engage in the lifestyle and make the cinema of a new oncoming, you know, wave of, uh, of fun. And if you've ever snowboarded and jumped out of a helicopter, you know, uh, and ridden powder, it's an incredible feeling. So I did five years of making snowboard movies. My first um, little three minute film, I was really fortunate and 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 my career happened because i was fortunate but i also rec recognized the opportunity and i would take it mm -hmm. so i met this guy kelly dole who owned a um japanese video distribution company um you know and i was at the trade show in las vegas and i had my 40 ounce underneath the table and we were 19 years old partying wow. and having a good time uh, at this wow. snowboard company trade show booth that i that i uh, rode for and um, he said, hey, you know, if you can produce a 40 minute long video, I'll give you a $25,000 check. And so I was in his hotel room an hour later calling my dad. I'm like, hey, what does in perpetuity mean? You know, and just figuring <laughs> yeah. out the contract stuff. So I sold the snowboard videos to the Japanese. And then that bottomed out once um, the uh, X Games came along. Yeah. Because all the money yeah. got sucked into television and putting the riders on onto the competition uh, TV show rather than spending you know hundreds of thousands of dollars and sending them into the Canadian backcountry to go film. Mm -hmm. So when that financing left, I moved back to Pebble Beach, um, Carmel area where I'm from, and I started valet parking cars. And the Clint Eastwood, Arnold Palmer, Richard Ferris, and uh, Peter Uberoth just bought Pebble Beach at the time. Oh, I and the yeah, and the 2000 U.S. Open uh, of golf was coming. Yeah. And so they pulled me, um, not they, but the, the president of the company at Pebble Beach uh, pulled me into his office one day, and I, I thought I was getting fired, like I had done something major. And they're like, hey, we want you. We Your mom's been showing us your snowboard videos at the executive Pebble Beach company mead board meetings, and we're hoping you can come in and save the video that ESPN screwed up on the US Open 2000. Wow. So I, I I took five grand of my own money. I took the five grand they gave me and I dumped it all in there. And that was kind of my opening to having a mainstream project. And then I, I started working for the news um, shortly afterwards because the Pebble Beach opportunity was a lot of fun. It was a really major uh, corporation to work with. It was a lot of legitimacy, but they weren't allowing me to move as quickly as I wanted. And when you're, you know, 22, 23 years old and, and you want to make it in film, you got to go, you got to go. Yeah. So luckily KCBA, um, 
you know, Fox 35 took me in and, and gave me a camera and a truck to drive around. And, and I yeah. started shooting. That's when I met you. And by the way, you know, I'm a big fan of you. I don't know if you know that, but I have been a big fan of you since the beginning. Oh. And yeah, well, no, you're wait, a talented wait, what's guy. Your, what's your PayPal address? Sorry. <laughs> no, we're, we're going to work together, dude. And, and I, the reason why I say that is I always see these interesting turns of performance that you do. I was watching Ellen the other day and I go, that's Will Roberts dancing on Ellen. And it was iconic. So much props to you. And that was when I met you. Um, and then um, I would shoot wedding videos on the weekend. Um, and um, Look, the TV station paid twelve dollars an hour, and you would get a, a truck and a and a gas card, and that only goes so far. And a wedding will pay you, you know, you can shoot two weddings on the weekend, make four grand, and you just made more money than you did in a whole month. In a month. Yeah. So after like, shooting two hundred weddings on the weekend, and I was doing music videos for Slightly Stupid, this band out of San Diego, and you know, I shot a Dave Matthews thing. Um, years later so i was doing music video stuff i'm shooting a wedding video and i run up to my truck to go get a tape for my camera when when they had tapes and i run back down to my camera and there is clint eastwood standing at my camera pretending he's the wedding videographer and people are coming into the wedding and they're laughing he's moving the camera around he's being really respectful because it's somebody else's equipment yeah but it's his yeah. resort his friend's wedding he's doing whatever the heck he wants yeah. so i'm yeah. like okay this is that moment what do i do this is that pebble beach you know you're getting brought into the office so i walk over to him i tap him on the shoulder i go hey mr eastwood um would you like for me to shoot a reverse on the bride or why to the wedding or you want me to do some cutaways and just kind of kidding you know and he goes where do i sit i go up by the front left uh you're on the bride's side and I ended up working for him for 10 years, um, did at least 40 projects for Dina. It was almost full time and, you know, flew back and forth on the Warner Brothers G5. And my job was to shoot everything that Malpaso could not do and would not do and was um, too independent. And so I got all these different little projects and it ended up culminating in, in doing The Forger with Dina Eastwood. Uh, and Lauren Bacall and Josh Hutcherson from The Hunger Games. And that was one of Scott Eastwood's first um, feature film roles. He had been in a, um, a movie with Terrence Howard uh, about a swim team. He played a racist swimmer that was competing against an African-American swim team. I forget the name of the movie. Great movie, though, if you get a chance. Terrence Howard movie. And so, you know, I'm like, he walks into the room and I go, this guy looks incredible. He looks just you know, like his father, and I'm contractually prohibited from drawing um, certain comparisons and sure. talking about certain things because he's sensitive about that. And I get that. So I'm, I'm going to back up there. But when I met him, you know, I really started to realize, hey, you know, we can make a couple movies together. And so um, when we finished The Forger, um, you know, he wanted to do a Western. The opportunity was there. Uh, we were calling it a period piece. We didn't even dare call it a Western because we are so respectful of his yeah. the big guy's legacy. Yeah. And But, you know, the script was what it was. And, and while I was shooting um, the Eastwood factor for Mr. Eastwood, we were on the beach, Rivera Beach in Carmel. And it was fun. I was hanging out with him all day. And we're sh he's running up and down the beach in his 80s. And I'm like, this guy's in better shape than I am. And he goes, well, what are you going to do next? And I said, I'm going to do a period piece with your son. Is that okay? Is that something that you'd like to see happen? And, and he was supportive. And he said, yeah, I, I look forward to seeing that. Um, make sure you get me a copy. So yeah. I still got to drop yeah. him off a copy. But That's cool. That so let me go kind of back. Right I want to go back because, uh, you know, I, I, although the show is film festival, it's the industry and everything, I always seem to have some sort of like, thing with the people I'm interviewing. And I have to tell you that back in the early, well, late seventies to early eighties into like even maybe 89, I was half pipe. I was uh, draining pools in Santa Cruz. Uh, oh, no way. Yeah. Dogtown. Show you skate the Begonia Park. Bowl, the Watsonville, uh, you know, uh, that, that pool. That was, yeah. well, there was, and then there was Soquel, the skate yeah. park. And, yeah. you know, it's funny because I talk to people and they're like, dude, I go, yeah, I was like, I was like stoner, 
I mean, before I came to KCBA and before I became a magician, I was just a hardcore. We had a, a quarter pipe that went in. I lived in PG up at the top of the hill, and my friend had a, a, a quarter pipe we made. Doug Guyett, really well known skater at the time, and Ska. And I was full on, like ripped jeans, half pipe, Ollie Air. I was doing it all. And people are like, dude, that's like back when skate. I go, yeah, Tony Alva. So when everybody tells me that was me, it, that was the beginning. You were there during the formative years of, of skateboarding. And you know, the interesting thing, and I don't think you can argue with me on this, is that culture that came out of skateboarding is what shaped modern culture today. Vans, clothing, the way I make my movies and the way I deal with my actors is the same way I deal with the, dealt with them on skateboard movies. You know, just build that relationship and it's all about the craft. And yeah. and then the Beastie Boys, you know, came along and yep. punk rock, Metallica. Metallica was like, you know, this hardcore underground heavy metal band that we all listened to in seventh grade. And, and now they're the biggest rock band in the world. So people that understand skateboarding culture and were involved in it, I think actually really had a uh, an edge on yeah. uh, what they wanted to do later on in life. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, uh, interestingly enough, I then was going back and forth to South Lake Tahoe because my girlfriend at the time, who I was with for almost 14 years, um, and yeah. she had a place up in South Lake. And so, you know, I was skiing and so on. But then someone said, would you like to try a board? I'm like, oh, no way. <laughs> so I literally never went back to and we had a place up in South Lake. So I was going up every weekend, going to Heavenly. And now what's not called Squaw. It's called Pasadena or something like that. Uh, yeah. I don't want the anyway, whatever. Uh, the point is, is that we were, you know, they were, she was ski patrol. So we would go up and, and, and I would snowboard. I was just like hardcore snowboarding. And so I fell in love with that. I had a Burton board. Anyway, I love talking about that stuff because you're right. It was the time that. If you were a, a skateboarder and I just call, when I say, I go tell people, I go, yeah, I was a skater. They're like, like, like in line. I'm like, no skater, you know, skate or die. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Anyway. So anyway, and, Warren, right. and, and by the way, uh, what you talk about with your films and you made them Warren Miller, dude, you were the snowboard Warren Miller, I guess. Yeah. That's huge. Well, I mean, I wouldn't equate myself anywhere near to Warren Miller. We had high eight cameras and it was just me, but um, you know, he was definitely the influence. Right he was a gun. godfather and, and he was a he was also to the uh the barometer of what we did not want to do and how we wanted to do things kind of differently in the sport. Yeah. Um yeah. and so now that we're on this topic, but we have to talk about movies, I'm gonna yeah. switch the subject yeah. slightly. I do have a uh snowboard. Uh, feature film, true story uh, mm. that I'm producing right now. Um, you know, I've, it's been in development for close to 10 years, ever since I I uh, went to Canada and kind of saw what happened. But there's a story, it's a true story about um, a guy who leased, at, he was a professional snowboarder, lost his sponsor and um, ended up uh, leasing a helicopter and smuggling marijuana over the border for many years wow. and made many millions of dollars and many people died. Many fortunes were made and a lot of families were started and a lot of stuff happened. And so I want to go back to Canada and tell that story, but shoot it with like the top snowboarders in the world and not do it like a Hollywood movie. I mean, when you watch some of my movies like Mountain Jim, the whole beginning of the search for Mountain Jim, um, which is a, uh, a remake of Animal Chin for skateboard enthusiasts um it has uh, all avalanche sequences in the beginning we took dynamite and blew up cornices and and this guy steve crutchell actually did it that we hired and so i want to go back to canada and, and set off avalanches and shoot snowboarding and and the whole drug smuggling thing but i do have to say that skateboarding and surfing and snowboarding were the three sports that actually kept me out of drugs and i never got into that scene and that's why i got two movies made and all the stuff. Whereas a lot of the kids, you know, that stayed in Carmel and, and didn't push themselves and didn't get out of town, you know, they're a little bitter and they're a little, you know, I'm calling them out, but it's like for any filmmaker, it's like, you don't have to be in Hollywood, but do get out of your own hometown and do push yourself to, to lead Just an interesting life. Just yeah. It, film, it informs your filmmaking. 
Yeah. You know? And you know, um, you know, you're, that's a great point because a lot of times I have the conversation with people. It's very interesting because when back in the day when I started in 80, whatever, uh, two or whatever, um, you know, people were talking about being in, in a small town. They're like, Oh, you're, you're big fish, small town. I'm like, I'm okay with that because I do know that when I became SAG, which was 85, then all of a sudden all of the, uh, coastal, uh, industrial or, uh, car commercials, I was driving the car and yeah. it was union and there wasn't any problem. Uh, Judith Poley, who had casting down there and wound up being uh, Jodie Foster's main person for background casting. You know, she said, Hey, do this commercial for me. I, I know it's small. It's only like 300 bucks or something. I go, cool. It's all right. It's, it's union. And it'll take you an hour. It was done at the church on the way off of 68. The one that's uh, by Robert. Lar no, is it, what's his name? Oh, uh, Catalina. And there's a church yeah. there. It was small. Yeah. An hour shoot. I got done. Before I got done, the director, Australian, said, Oh, give me a favor. Do you want touch this? Or I ain't up the road like that. I'm like, Okay, cool. Well, two months later, I got a call from a New York um, ad agency saying, You've been upgraded because you touched the product. Okay. I'm like, Cool. They go, oh, yeah. Oh, cool. You got Taft Hartley in or something. I got, well, well, what I got was they said, You can if you want. But consequently, <clears throat> what happened was, um, when they called me, they said, we upgraded you to a principal. So you're going to get like a check for the principal thing. Well, what they didn't tell me is the residuals, $18,000. I oh, immediately wow. joined. Uh, and they're like, people are like, why would you join in such a small town? I went, because I'm only two hours from San Francisco. And I'm the only dude that looks like me and can drive in, in this town. So I wound up doing a lot of really good stuff that yeah. wasn't even a question. They'd go, well, Will's kind of the only union guy here that, well, fits the bill. So the point is, is what you've said is, is that, but you still need to leave your area. You still need to get out of that. So you understand that. But the cool thing is, is that what people were concerned about back in the day was that if you're in a small town, that LA wouldn't take you seriously. For instance, that commercial, the two leads were from LA and all they did was yeah. get on the thing going, I love you and touch the car. Well, yeah. consequently that, that perception is changed. Because you can be cast, I'm cast all around the world. And the point is, is that you can do whatever you want from where you're at, which brings us to your company. But first, do you mind if I take a small break? Do you have time to hang out? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm having fun, man. Good, good, good. All right. Hey, everybody, I'm going to take on a little uh, break here, but here's the point. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, someone that we had on the show before, uh, Andrea Dretch. She is an actress out of uh, Colorado. Um, I actually just started doing a web series. You can see it on my Instagram, which is Will Roberts Official. But they have a film that all of a sudden now is being, uh, well, I should say it's on a couple of the platforms. I want you to look at this and know here's where you can get it. Why are you not answering your phone? Mom has gone AWOL and I could really use your help. AWOL? Do you even know what that means? She's probably been drinking again. I need you to look for her. Mom, what are you doing? I just need to come down soon. I'm sorry, what does that mean? It means she wants us to watch her try and kill herself. I need 24 hours to tape her off. Tape her off? What's going on here, Lena? Long or short? Let's try the short. I've been having an affair and now I'm being blackmailed like you. Why do I get the feeling I should be calling the police right now? <laughs> I wouldn't. What do you mean? Why not? I think by the time they get here, you will already be an accomplice. All right, now available on Prime, uh, which is kind of cool. By the way, Monday, starting Monday, right now we're doing this here, but on Monday we're going to start doing our Amazon. I'm an Amazon influencer live streamer. So basically means that I can put these shows on Amazon, and on the lower third you can see products and films and ring lights and shit, and you can order it. There it is. So that's kind of cool. We're going to be going that direction. So uh, I think Amazon seems like a pretty good idea. Uh, so again, no matter what you do and what you produce, you can get it out there. I don't even care if you're using your iPhone anymore. It doesn't really matter. All right, let's go back to our guest. All right. So um, Lawrence, so let's talk a little bit about uh, your company. 
you're doing a major motion picture company and you're doing it out of basically the Monterey Peninsula. And I'm seeing you're very aggressive now on the social media of the Facebook and everything, showing people different things and you've got a group and so on. Let's talk about um, where it is and where you'd like to see it go. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you are right. Um, you know, I, I was off social media for quite some time and then I just all of a sudden turned it up to 11. But look, there's no better Rolodex out there to get your company and what you're doing um, because of the social media. You know, before we even opened the doors, we had a client hire us for a for a TV commercial. You know, we're moving the stuff in the office. So, you know, it's been good to be back up and running after the pandemic. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, my bread and br butter um, is really right now TV commercials. And then the producing that I do for the movies, uh, a movie takes, you know, probably about five years to produce from beginning to end. I'm talking about conceptualization of the idea right. all the way uh -huh. through to financing, screenplay, um, not in particular in that order. And then, you know, execution of the, the filming of the movie and then the distribution release is always a five year kind of span yeah. so what i started to notice is i had these two different streams space rock studios is my movie company that is the company that did diablo um that's a company that i represent uh for my work on the forger because i'm a space rock studios director mm -hmm. but then the carmel movie company is my opportunity to have mm -hmm. a business in my hometown and produce local and national tv commercials and practice kind of my filmmaking craft within making these commercials. So a client will come to me and they'll be like, hey, Lawrence, we wanna do a national commercial for Fox. You know, I just got one the other day and we're testing out some new cameras and playing with some lenses because, you know, the client's paying for it, they want that look. And I'm like, well, we're, let's prepare for the next movie. So it's been a lot of fun these past couple months having the division between the two companies. I'm way busier than I should be, um, but my uh, producing partner, you know, you got like 12 things going on at once. Yeah, well, I always do. Uh, my, my producing partner, Annette anderson Caton, um, who, she's amazing. She worked for The Simpsons. She ran the, the head office for Matt Groening for close mm -hmm. to a decade, worked on Futurama, and she's a production consultant on Chadwick Boseman's last movie, Marshall. Uh, before he passed. She's now supporting it and uh, running all the infrastructure. So like doing the billing and, and a lot of the coordination of the shoots and we're jamming. I'm, I couldn't be happier now. I'm too busy. So it's, um, you know, that's the way I do it. I, uh, Space Rock Studios is for the movies. Carmel Movie Company is a local you know, kind of movie company, but they're going to be interchangeable and intermixable because um, you know, Space Rock is more of a play on, um, on you know, this is planet Earth, man. You know, we're we're on a we're on a rock flying through space. I love science fiction, so that's my little baby. And then Carmel Movie Company is local um, and kind of more traditional. What people don't realize is the reason why we chose the name Carmel Movie Company is the early kernel of California creativity pre-Hollywood, pre-Charlie Chaplin, any yeah. of the studio, Max Sennett Studios, is all from Carmel. Yeah. Carmel was the most prolific art community from 1906 to 1924 in the entire world. Right. And the French still teach a class on California bohemian culture mm -hmm. in university in Paris. Right. And a lot of Californians don't know this. And I picked up Clint Eastwood, to mention him again, uh, Mr. Eastwood directed a, um, not directed, he uh, narrated and starred in a film called Don't Pave Main Street, which is all about Carmel and the history of Carmel. And it was, to watch that documentary was mind blowing. Um, the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, came out of Carmel because Upton Sinclair, who was the author of The Jungle, um, lived here and used to hang out at the Forest Theater and do theatrical shows, you know, but also to wow. help change, um, you know, the way our, our country works. Uh, Jack London, John Steinbeck, all these people. So long story short, you know, I just wanted to tap into that history and kind of find something that was unique um, and a little bit more traditional than the 1930s Hollywood. Well, one thing that I really appreciate doing, which is that um, I, I'm a firm believer in this business that you kind of need to uh, present yourself 
um, larger than you appear in the rearview mirror. Uh, because the thing is, is that in this day and age, you know, everybody can be everything. You just go into Google or YouTube and you could be a, a writer, you can be a, a, a radio host or a podcast host or a live stream, whatever. You know, it, there there isn't, you know, this is probably, to quote a good friend of mine, Kevin E. West, uh, you, you don't really have to have a degree in this industry. I mean, people always ask me, they go, hey, you, boy, oh boy, what schools did you go to? I went, I didn't go to any schools. And they went, are you kidding? I'm like, no, I just did it. And, you know, it's the only industry that you can do that. However, uh, the people that do succeed are the people who understand that uh, you have to give yourself depth and not just go after the dollar, which is not a lot in this industry, and go after the fame. You just have to love what you do. And then when you do it, you just have to have what we call, this is amazing, show business, the business of show. And mm -hmm. a lot of people don't have that. And so, again, I commend you because you're doing something that allows people to see you, but you're also holding a very high bar for the fact that you're saying, I don't give a shit if I'm in Topeka, Kansas. This is a company, you know, Carmel Movie, that you're going to know because we're producing top-notch stuff. So, uh, again, I know that you're doing both things. Some things you have to do just to make some revenue come in. But I also can tell by that film that we saw with Scott that um, you're you're up there. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, look, there's a couple good. You tapped into something um, which I think our audience really should know, um, and you've already said it is you know you can make a movie from anywhere in the world, um, and you can have a career from anywhere in the world. So it's really a give and take. Some people like urban environments and some people are, um, how should I say it? They're cool with dealing with the 405 and I-5 yeah, and Hollywood rush hour traffic. I personally am not. I, I'm fortunate I'm from a small California hometown that has a lot of uh, financial resources because of the beauty of the place. Uh -huh. So I'm able to tap into the financing. I'm able to circumvent Hollywood and tap into private equity financing to finance my projects. Mm -hmm. And so, and then also too, we've got the biggest lawbreaker in Hollywood, you know, Mr. Eastwood, who has long said, yeah, I don't want to live in Hollywood. I, I just want to live in Carmel and I'll go down there and have a house and be there when I need to. So I, I'm fortunate in that way. It is not Topeka, Kansas. There are opportunities afforded to me because it is Carmel yeah. and because yeah. of the people involved. But I got to tell the story about Stephen Altman. Um, he's the son of Robert Altman, the director, who, by the way, is, I think, from Olathe, Kansas, or somewhere in, in Kansas, uh, Robert Altman uh, was from. And he created a, a career out of Kansas, um, went to Hollywood, made it big. And Stephen, his son, who just was a production designer on Capote, um, Capone, sorry, that's a little bit of a screw up. Capone, um, you know, and, and was nominated for an Academy Award for uh, Gosford Park. He lives in Monterey and he's just hanging here, you know, and a job comes through, he'll fly to Calgary, he'll go do the work. Yeah. And so it's perfectly, the pandemic changed the whole paradigm yeah. and it created, you know, human beings, we do a lot of things because we're insecure. And once that insecurity of like, hey, we can't be in the same room um, was gone, um, it really opened things up for the industry. So at yeah. that moment, I decided, hey, look, I'm going to live in paradise in a small hometown and and just do it from here and, and shape it that way. And, yeah. it, and it works. Yeah, yeah. It works. And, and here's the thing. Here's the thing is, is that, you know, like I said, back in the 80s when I started, the thing is, is that the only people that did what you're saying were the Clint Eastwoods, were the A-listers because they went, hey, I don't give a shit, you know. You're going to want me. I'll fly there. You'll pay for me to do it. We could not, you and I, could not do what we're doing now uh, back then because that was not what we did. Yes, the pandemic did change that, but so did film festivals. And that's what we're kind of trying to do with FilmFestivalLive.com, which is, yeah. you know, I say this all the time, is just that for the longest time, the film festival has been sitting in the back of the seat, a car, and now they're not only in the front seat, but they're kind of in the driver's seat because yeah. all the things you could not do in Hollywood before you're now going, I, I can be anywhere. So yeah. that is an awesome thing. 
All right, Lawrence, Lawrence Rock, I appreciate it. Of course, writer, director, and producer. Thanks for coming on the show. I have to wrap it up, um, but I really do appreciate it. And I'm probably going to have you on again and um, your other lovely partner because I know her. And uh, uh, so with that being said, thanks for coming on the show and being on. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to see you. Um, you and I love seeing your performances out there. I love seeing you on Ellen the other day. <laughs> and when you want to have us back, I have some wonderful composers that worked on The Lion King that I would I love, love to introduce you to. They're right down the street from me. They're the other component of Carmel Creativity. So thank you for having me. Yeah, and listen, um, I'm going to be in Monterey Salinas here in the next week. So I think we're all going to have a drink or something to eat at least. Let's let's do uh, let's do lunch, baby. Let's do sushi. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but come come, and the burgers are on me. <laughs> I love. Oh yeah, you know what? I again, I used to. I spent so many years at the uh, at the um, uh, on Dolores doing dinner theater, and I specialize in British farce. And remember the Richard Barrett and Elizabeth Barrett, and that beautiful. Now it's an art gallery. It was so sad to see it go. Yeah. But, you know, and the Forest Theater. I did Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, and I know I did other stuff. I can't. Oh, I did Showboat. Uh, I just love that area, and uh, I definitely. And I used to have an office on Ocean. And I was when I left the station because there was a guy named Chris and he he created the uh, the the doodle top, which had markers. In yeah, it. I think I have your old office. You're so you're so <laughs> funny, dude. Um, Chris McKay invented the I beam, which was the flip top watch. With I have the it. It's called the and then and the it's doodle top the watch. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have, have his old office. office. You. Oh, my God. Oh yeah. God. So I had the front, <laughs> I had the front office with the little balcony and I was doing his ASI and we were doing the glow cup. Yeah. Oh, wow. Memory. I remember all of that stuff. You were there right before me. Carmel movie company was started in that building. Um, and the Eastwoods were my first client and, and I have your old office or I'm wow. probably right and next I, to I, it. <laughs> I, and, and my good friend, who I don't know what she's doing now. I know her and Miles and Rhonda no longer are Miles and Rhonda, I think. But uh, Rhonda has the real estate office. At least she did. She was a hoot. I did a lot of Froman Academy stuff with her. But anyway, we'll have that show another time. Thanks for coming on the show, my friend. Thank you. All Take right. care. Bye -bye. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming on the show and watching it again. If you're interested, you can check us out at filmfestivallive.com. If you want to be a guest, come on there. It doesn't matter. I got to get out of here. I've got two auditions to shoot, self-tapes for, and a lot of other stuff, and I know you do too. So we'll see you next time on the show, and thanks for hanging out with us.